What's up everyone? I'm Will Fulton. Welcome to Thrillist Best and the Rest. This is the video component of our weekly podcast. Today we're going to sit down with two experts who are going to describe what natural wine is. Also, they're going to recommend a bunch of very inexpensive but delicious natural wines that you can buy at home. Now, if you want to listen to the full episode, check out the link in our description or search Thrillist Best and the Rest on Spotify, iHeartRadio, the Apple Podcast app, pretty much wherever you get your podcast, you'll be able to find us. But for now, stick around. It's a lot of fun, and we kind of drink a lot, too. What's up, everyone? I'm Will Fulton. Welcome to Thrillist Best and the Rest. If you pay even the slightest amount of attention to the wine world or have gone outside in Brooklyn, New York in the past year, you'll notice natural wine is kind of everywhere. If you drink wine regularly, it's hard to miss. But still, obviously, plenty of confusion around what it means to be natural. So I'm here today with Jenny Lefcourt, natural wine importer via her company, Jenny and Francois Selections. Hey, Jenny, how are you? Hi, how are you? And Lena Matson, GM and wine director at June in Cobble Hill. That's a great bar. I had a date there once. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Yeah. Many do. The date went horribly, though, well, but it wasn't June's fault at thank all. You. It was great. <laughs> so how are you guys doing today? <laughs> great. We're good. Terrific. We're going to go in a little more in depth on this in a little bit, but I want to ask you about your businesses, starting with you, Jenny. Uh, Jenny and Francois Selections, what is that exactly? I am a wine importer, so we select wines all over the world now and import them to the U.S., and then I sell them to stores and restaurants in New York with my team here, and then to distributors in other states. Yeah, it's a selection process. It's a curation of a portfolio of wines. And my company is 20 years old now. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Almost legal to drink. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and Elena, a little bit about June besides the fact that it's a great place to have a good or bad date. Correct. June is Brooklyn's very first natural wine bar. Opened a little over five years ago in Cobble Hill. We did compost. So it's the sustainability goes beyond just the wine as well. Awesome. So without giving too much information out about your personal life, how often do you drink wine at 10 a.m. like we're doing right now at the time of this taping? <laughs> Pretty often, actually. Really? Pretty often. This yeah. Is, all right. I, Yesterday. Uh, for, once, <laughs> for once, I'm the one that uh, <laughs> drinks less than the guest. Um, so I think wine is something that makes people feel, feel uh, intimidated, inferior. I think that people often are scared to ask questions about wine because they think it makes them seem less intelligent, less sophisticated. It's, it's like kind of like the economy. Everyone pretends like they know how it works. No one really knows how it works. So I guess today I want you to kind of be here to break down those walls, leave no stupid questions unasked, and I'm full of stupid questions. Also drink a lot of great wine early in the morning. In a little bit, we're going to be taste testing and recommending some surprisingly inexpensive, and they look delicious wines uh, that everyone out there could go out and buy. There's definitely a lot of confusion around what Natty Wine actually is. So I think, first off, can you tell me, am I correct in my assumption that Natural wine is more of a concept, more of an ideal than an actual designation. So there isn't a label, like a a governmental label for natural wine. Mm -hmm. However, there are certifications for organically grown grapes or biodynamically grown grapes. So that's sort of the basis of natural wine is first and foremost what happens in the vines. Okay. So there's no chemicals synthetic chemicals used in the vines um, in terms of natural wine. That's the base of everything. Okay. It's something that people don't really realize. Most wine is made with you know, grapes that are not grown organically. Sure. It's pretty rare to find organic wineries. Like in France, for example, I don't have the exact percentage, but it's something like less than 5% of all wineries grow organic grapes. Okay. And do you know like what how uh, how American wines like Napa wine stack up against that that kind of statistic? There's not a lot. Yeah, there's very very few. So yeah, so that's the base. Those organic grapes or biodynamically grown grapes are brought to the cellar, and the wine is made. And there's hundreds of additives that are legal in wine making. Right. And so usually the way people make wine is to take the grapes add sulfite, sulfites to the grapes themselves to kill off bacteria. Because I know that word comes up a lot, you know, when you when you talk about wine in general, but also natural it's wine. A, it's a preservative. It's used in many things. Like mm-hmm. if you ever bought apricots, like the only reason they're the pretty color is because they have lots of sulf- 
sulfites on them. Mm -hmm. If you buy apricots without it, they're brown. It's a preservative. Okay. So there's nothing like necessarily wrong with preservative, but so most wine is made, kill off the indigenous yeast, kill off any bacteria, and then buy a lab. This is rather technical. But no, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, that's why, that's why you're here, honestly. But I mean, essentially wine uh, or natural wine, it's organically grown grapes that are then in the cellar. There's none or very few of those hundreds of additives that are permissible in wine making right. that aren't listed on the label, which is a big scandal of the wine, <laughs> wine world. So it's not so much that, you know, there should be a label for natural wine and yeah. there should be all of these millions of additives listed on the back label and they're not. But there's not in, in quote unquote conventional wine. So it makes it backwards, like why, why should natural wine have to prove itself like the way most wine is made? They should say what they're doing and list their additives. <laughs> yeah. When did, I guess you'd call them, unnatural wine become the norm as far as winemaking goes? Uh, the agricultural revolution when we wanted to produce the most, the easiest, the quickest, you know, very American concept. Mm -hmm. um, and rightfully so, right? Recovering from d wars, things like that. But there then became a disconnect from something that's like truly genuine and a real craft and a love and appreciation of the land. It just, wine then became a commodity. Uh, that that's That's my experience. Yeah. I mean, you can't uh, blame you know farmers for wanting to make their life easier sure. and so yeah. bringing, make money yeah make money <laughs> bringing chemicals into the vines was to make things easier or, right. you know initially is it necessarily a bad thing it is okay. <laughs> <laughs> it pollutes the earth so I mean I personally eat organic yeah you know yeah I outside mean, wine as it's, well it's on a real basic level I talk about it like eating McDonald's every day versus eating organic food you can eat McDonald's and it's okay. You're not a bad person. Thank you. Yeah. You're, you're okay. <laughs> but also in this day and age, you're very aware that you're consuming a product that's full of chemicals. It's not 100% meat or potatoes or whatever it may be. And it has been pumped with stuff to, you know, fats and acids and sugars that are really attractive to our palates. But yeah, I love Coca-Cola. I eat candy, right? I'm yeah. not a purist. And I think that's really important to acknowledge too. Eating Agreed. organic. <laughs> I mean, I, I also eat very healthy too. You Try. know, I don't yeah. go to McDonald's, but once you a know. year. Yeah. I <laughs> mean, <laughs> yeah. What do you order? <laughs> you know, the regular Big Mac, Big Mac yeah. fries, <laughs> Coke. <laughs> so Lena, when, when you're describing like, um, uh, the flavor profiles of natural wine versus, uh, again, I guess, conventional wine. Is that the way that we should call uh, the standard of wine that's unnatural? Conventional, is that the right word? Conventional. Yeah, conventional. That's, yeah. that's what I use, conventional. Um, how would you describe the differences between, um, like, even literally how they taste? Uh, natural wines are living. So when you just think about that while you're drinking, you can you taste that, that there's electricity in the wines. There's something vibrant. There's something changing and that you know if you sit with a bottle for an hour or two you really shouldn't sit more than that with one bottle but yeah. you you know you can see the wine <laughs> I never do. yeah <laughs> doing something wrong then um but you can see the wine feel the wine change over time and that's a really exciting thing too it's living it, as something should right it shouldn't stay solid forever. It's mm -hmm. a living product that and eventually should die. So we consume it when it's at its peak. When you talk about um, the flavor changing and, and being alive, do you mean it actually changes from sip to sip, from glass to glass? Yeah. The the contact with oxygen makes a huge difference for some wines. Right. Uh, the temperature will make a difference. The, the mouthfeel just continuously changes. And that's what's really exciting. Like arguably the best sip of wine is the very last sip, assuming that the wine isn't filtered yeah. um, via like fish bladders, like conventional wine, which is not vegetarian. <laughs> uh, you, yeah. Correct. <laughs> correct. Not. There were a lot of uh, terminology uh, tossed around. So uh, I want to ask a couple questions about that. Organic versus natural. Is all natural wine organic, but not all organic wine is natural? Natural is applying to both in the vines and in the cellar. Organics is simply how you're treating the grapes and or fruit okay. in, you know, out in the wild. Okay. So a wine doesn't have to be natural if it's, and most of them are not. 
Right. So, yeah. so the the when someone says organic wine, they're really talking about how the grapes are cultivated and not the process of making the wine. Yeah, okay. and even in the states, it's really tricky. There's like a few different um, ways that you can say it. You can say made from organic grapes or sourced from organically produced grapes or mm-hmm. something like that. There's and also a hundred percent organic wine. Yes. And these are all different. Are they very, mean completely different That's things. That's why I wanted to bring you guys. Yeah. <laughs> us as well though, yeah. you know, yeah. and there's no really rhyme or reason except for probably, you know, money and politics behind it, unfortunately. So that's very confusing. There's different ways that organic can be on the label. And at the end of the day, that wine is, you know, hyper conventional. Yeah, totally. Right. So Yeah. So if it's like 100 percent organic wine, that does mean it doesn't have additives, but it could be like filtered to death. Right. And like, you know. Cooled, cooled down, heated up, water extracted from it. There's all kinds of things that could be done to it anyway, which yeah. is why we say there really isn't a label for natural wine because mm-hmm. 100% organic wine is not, in the end, it's not what it should be. That's a little uh, disheartening to say, oh, you can't even count on reading organic on a label. Mm-hmm. What you can count on is an importer and distributor. So working on off the back label. And so actually that is what... A label can give you and and can denote natural wine. Um, As in, a, like you know, Jenny and Francois. Y- yeah, selections. you go to yeah. the you go to a store. You don't have to know anything about wine, but if you go in knowing that if you find a wine that has the Jenny and Francois label, that you are getting something natural and genuine and within a small spectrum of naturalness. Mm-hmm. And that depends on regions, producers, you know, where they're at in their lives and um, careers. Another thing I want to ask you is about um, uh, biodynamic. That that term I, I hear a lot at natural wine bars. Could you describe that? Because I've heard things about a buried cow skull filled with manure. <laughs> I mean, is this Close. are these rumors? Are these true? These are true. Okay. But the basic concept is rather than just not putting chemicals into the ground, mm-hmm. um, making um, sure that the earth is alive. Right. And what do you mean by helping. That? the earth to be alive. You can look at an organic vineyard and it can be very neat and pretty, but you can go to a biodynamic uh, winery and see a huge variety of flora, fauna, life, bees. Right, okay. Um, I think the idea is to create biodiversity and biodiversity is something we're losing now. Mm -hmm. So a little bit less control than manicured as far as how, how the grapes are grown, how it's harvested. Um, yeah, uh, but it's it's really um, facilitating and helping life. Yeah, a self-sustaining community, basically. So they're where plants and animals are all living harmoniously and benefiting off of each other. Yeah, does it run with the lunar cycles? That is also something that someone told me. That's also something that biodynamic producers pay a lot of attention to. And it's, it's common sense, you know, farming. Yeah. Because, you know, you pay attention to, you know, when the sap goes up in a tree like Mm -hmm. you know when to prune you're not going to prune when you know spring is happening and you know you're going to wound the vine so i mean just cycles lunar cycles also influence that Uh, yeah moon phases i mean it's easy for people to say oh it's a little bit hippy dippy but you know you don't have to be doing your tarot cards while you're harvesting the grapes. But again, it's this respect for the earth. Okay, if the earth is giving right now, then you take. And if the earth is wanting, you give to it and working together. Would you say that um, biodynamic wine, and I don't mean this in a pejorative, but is the most extreme type of natural wine? Not necessarily. It really depends on the winemaker, I would say, because, you know, there's... um, different philosophies, for example, on filtering, Mm -hmm. on sulfites, levels of sulfites. Um, Can a natural wine contain sulfites? It can, you know, and I have no problem with a winemaker using some sulfites. It's up to them if Mm -hmm. they feel like their wine needs it. But there's a difference between 20 milligrams per liter and 200 milligrams per liter. And you can taste it, you can feel it. It affects how the wine is and the pleasure of the wine yeah. to me. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, so speaking of wine, <laughs> um, we are going to taste some of these wines in front of us. They look great. Uh, right after this quick break. 
Okay, we are back, and I'm actually, I'm ready to try some wine, for sure. Uh, right. What would you like to start with? I especially wanted to show what this looks like, because I think that there's lots of stuff floating right. in it. Yeah, if you're listening, um, this is what I would call an orange wine, and we'll get into that definition. Um, and it does have a lot of sediment uh, in inside of it, and I think that's one... Um, of the things that people associate with all natural wines, but not all natural wine has sediment in it. Is that correct? No, right. correct, correct. Um, and what is that? Not, sediment? it's just, uh, you know, it hasn't been filtered. Uh -huh. So there's some good stuff in there yeah. <laughs> that hasn't been taken out. What is that good stuff and, exactly? Yeah, it's part of the grapes. It's part of the grapes. You okay. know, this is grape juice, fermented grape juice. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like So kind of like, you know, if you buy a, apple cider that's not filtered you're gonna have some sediment sure. in the bottom definitely um so you know this looks cloudy yeah and um you think it, that kind of deters some people have you, have you had that in your i think that you know especially um people who have been drinking more conventional wines for many years might look at it and say what is that why yeah. does that something's wrong with it exactly so um, to me, I look at it, it's this gorgeous mm -hmm. <laughs> amber so color. so excited. That's what you're looking for. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, they haven't taken the good stuff out. Right. So, um, you know, uh, there's different varying opinions, and it's also about taste. Some people prefer a filtered wine. For me, this is more complex. There's more going on. So I, I mentioned the orange wine. I Somebody... A bartender didn't yell at me, but they kind of were like, well, it's not really called, you're not really supposed to call it orange wine. Uh, Lena, is that, is that true? Well, first of all, he's a jerk. You can call yeah. it whatever you want. Right. And, you know, um, and it was a dude. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Um, it's orange wine. It's skin contact. It's amber. It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. different depending on who you ask. It's uh, macerated white wine. I mean, at the end of the day, it's orange is a lot easier white than grapes. all of those. Correct. Terms, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, for example, on my wine list, I have it as skin contact. Okay. And it used to be orange, but then I had a lot of questions um, if it was made from oranges. Mm hmm. And it is, it's orange. It, and it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's quite literally orange. So I changed it to skin contact, which means, uh, you know, the skin of the grape is in contact with the juice, which then takes the color, which is how red wine is made. Okay. Um, right. And, and orange wine, skin contact wine, uh, in general, is very popular right now. Am I right in that? Yes. It is popular. Um, it's a white wine with a little more texture to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's best of both worlds, right? You get kind of the structure of a red wine, but the freshness of a white wine. So these orange wines are skin contact. They're not always orange, too, depending on the the skin color. Yeah. Um, like Pinot Grigios, a lot of them can be very pink or red, um, sometimes a very deep amber. But so it's the same concept. It's just sitting with the skins. And why do you think there's been kind of a, a surge in popularity of orange wines? Um, I think it goes hand in hand with um, the rise of the natural wine movement, just this awareness that you don't have to filter a wine, that mm -hmm. a wine can look different. And it's a kind of more extreme version of that. It's beautiful looking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we should try it. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm very ready. So this also has a bottle cap, right. which is, woo. <laughs> it's, it's overflowing a little bit, but you, that was, you have some good reflexes on that. I feel like you've done this before. <laughs> Thanks. Additionally, though, you know, the sediment Thank you. is active. So when she was moving the bottle around a little mm -hmm. bit, it kind of woke the wine up. <laughs> I love that. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Hey, cheers. Thanks again for coming on. This looks <laughs> great. So this comes from Italy. Yeah, and um, what 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 brand is this? It comes from Puglia. It's okay. a brand. Uh, the name is Calcarius. Calcarius. It's made by a woman named Valentina Pasolacqua. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Valentina, if you're listening, uh, thank she, you for this. She she is a one, wonderful person who yeah. I adore. Who she's I she's awesome. She's awesome. She's from the region. She had left and gone off to London and was going to be a big shot mm -hmm. in a big city and then decided to go home to her hometown once she had a, a her daughter. Yeah. And she makes these beautiful wines which are completely unique for the region. There's nothing like it there. 
Very cool. It does seem like kind of investigating some of these natural winemakers, they oftentimes have a very interesting story that kind of goes along with their wine. Have you found that to be the case? That, Absolutely. Yeah, that, and that's what I relate to. You know, there's tons of great wine, so it's um, the feeling and the stories behind it and the connections with these growers because you have the opportunity to have an actual personal connection with them. Right. Um, but, yeah, the stories are interesting because who – is going to just choose for fun to work outside alone <laughs> and risk losing everything always, right? Yeah. By natural winemakers, I mean, you you know, it's, it's fine to talk about chemicals and we're anti this, but that's also very risky, right? And this is their livelihood. So this, there's often really cool stories behind these people because they are very unique human beings that have chosen this path. Awesome, yeah. Um, I just, for, for the people at home, I just want to spell this out so they can try it. Uh, Cal Calcarius, C-A-L-C-A-R-I-U-S. It's, it's, it's really good. I feel it's very refreshing. It's, 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 it has kind of a tartness that's like actually really nice. Um, yeah. Absolutely easy. Did I nail it? Yeah. You nailed it. <laughs> nice. Easy pleasure. <laughs> Just easy pleasure. Excellent. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, it kind of tastes like breakfast. You know, it's very bright and soft, like a little sunshiny, um, you know, a little orangey, which is, yeah. Sure. Uh, but really <laughs> kind yeah. of like Citrus. Sunny D Definitely. that has a little bit, you know, more tartness and yeah, but just really soft and approachable. I've been searching my whole life for an alcoholic Sunny D, <laughs> as I'm sure many of our listeners have too. Um, You're, welcome. Kind of You're welcome. You're <laughs> welcome. Exactly. That's awesome. So uh, I think that in this century, we've seen a rise in people, specifically young people, seeking out craft beers, uh, looking to for organic sources of food, consuming things that have a more natural or, I don't really like this word, but artisanal lean. Um, it seems like wine has kind of caught up to that in this natural wine movement. Um, how do you think people's tastes in general, uh, especially pertaining to wine, are different than they were 10, 20 years ago? Um, well, when I started 20 years ago, it was a very different wine world, right. much more conservative. There were sort of the, these um, retail shops in New York that had been around for a few generations, mm -hmm. Italian-owned, um, and... Um, there weren't all these many, many smaller boutique shops, and there certainly weren't any natural wine bars like right. June. And so um, people didn't really want to hear so much about the technical, like how the wine is made, anything yeah. about sulfites and filtering and all that. So I just like went around town opening the wines for people. But I think the real true wine professionals of the time would taste with their palates and say, hey, this knocks my socks off yeah. this is something so unique and delicious um so even then you know there was a recognition that something special was in the bottle yeah and, and you and jenny you were one of the first people really in, at least in the states to be a proponent of natural wine and, and pour it and bring it in and try to uh, you know let people taste it and see for themselves yeah. how great it was right yeah started as a very french movement and mm -hmm. so in the beginning we were an all french company and, um, but I would say, you know, there was little, t I mean, there certainly weren't pet nuts and orange wine, but when I brought in like the second one, I'd love to taste today. I would, yes. Is, uh, we can get started on that also. A Remy, Remy du Fetre, uh, Premis Beaujolais Village. And, um, we'll list the names of these wines also <laughs> in, um, in our description. So, so find them easily. I yeah. mean, light reds with a lot of acidity was kind of what brought me initially to natural wine, uh -huh. along with Chenin Blanc and the Loire. But, um, but I thought wine was supposed to be big and a lot of alcohol yeah. and very kind of jammy. And I didn't really like that. And so I didn't think I liked wine. And then when I was in France, I went to study and study film and literature and go to wine bars. Yeah, and <laughs> that sounds pretty great. And so when I started tasting these lighter, brighter, higher acid wines with dinner or with lunch, mm -hmm. I was <laughs> like, what is this? This yeah. is crazy. It tastes so good. Right. And so that was kind of the beginning. So 
um, red wines from the Loire Valley and from Beaujolais were kind of the open the door to natural wine for for me for my palate. I just just because it tasted good. Totally. <laughs> um, Americans specifically versus other cultures have never really developed uh, taste. We organic food and start you know that that was the first thing, and then being open to something not being one specific way, like a light-bodied red, that it's yeah. not supposed, doesn't have to taste oaky, and it's fine if you like that too. And uh, you know, I, the, the popular wines in the 90s, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, were kind of uh, very rich, very uh, clean, flawless, like like if Pierce Brosnan was a wine, yeah, that would be the kind of thing he was. While as these are, you know, like you were saying, Lane, is they're a little bit more dynamic, they're a little bit more fun, they're a little bit more um, alive. Yeah, that's awesome. And and what are we drinking right here? It's it's red for sure. So this I can confirm that <laughs> in my own expertise. This is made from the Gamay grape, okay, which is a generally a fruitier, lighter grape. But uh, the winemaker Remy Dufet mm-hmm. um, has a sp- Wonderful, light touch. Um, is is Gamay the uh, name of the varietal? Gamay. Gamay. Okay. Awesome. Often found in the Beaujolais region okay. of France. Okay. Beaujolais. And yeah. where is that in France? Beaujolais is made from Gamay. You know, how can you uh, do? You want to describe what you taste in this wine? I mean, it has this kind of um, raspberry thing going on, but mm-hmm. besides that, you know, we all have different palates. Mine's really muted. My asthma and allergies and. Or cats. Uh, yeah, I feel that. <laughs> no, but am I inhaling my pocket? I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I think this has like a touch of like a grittiness, which is really nice. But this high acid, and you know the temperature that this is at right now, mm. that's my most popular section on my wine list. It is very tasty, and I I think that like um you know we were talking about the cloudiness. I think that's one thing that people associate with natural wine. I think also like. Um, uh, another word that comes out a lot is funkiness, but that's not necessarily true, right? It's it's almost like any other type of varietal that you like with conventional wines, you can find an analog in the natural world. Is that fair to say? Yes, you can find anything. Natural wine does not mean funky or weird mm-hmm. or cloudy right. or um, any of these things. It doesn't have to be weird to yeah. be natural. And... Um, for me, that's kind of the coolest thing. To f- finding Chardonnays from California that I like, I love that because we all hate California Chardonnays, right? So to find Who is we here? Americans, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, lots of Big, people. You know, oaky, yeah, like right. flabby. <laughs> you ask people what you don't sure. like, people will say that or sweet rieslings or something. Sure. So you know. Um, that challenge is the coolest thing for me to not like a grape and then find and then start loving it like Chardonnay. I didn't right. drink Chardonnay many years ago and now it's one of my favorite grapes and I love showing that to other people too. They say they don't like Chardonnay and I pour them Chardonnay and they're like, oh my God, it's amazing. Chardonnay. Because it's mm-hmm. such a broad descriptor. Correct. It's, you know, yeah. There's a lot of nuances within that world. Well, and Chardonnay is one of the most adaptable grapes. So depending where in the world you are growing it, you know, that terroir, the entire environment around it um and then also the winemaker and yeah it it's so nuanced and and it's true that the word funky sometimes hides a fault you sure. know yeah. uh, there's a lot of wines either uh conventional or natural which i don't like you know not every wine is well made yeah. and so sometimes you know it's uh it's not pleasurable. Definitely. Um, we're all about pleasure here. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, we're going to take another quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to try the final two bottles and ask more questions. So stick around. Okay, so we're back. Uh, I, I want to ask you guys a quick question. I have to say, in my um, in my non-refined taste, a lot of the time when I go t- into a wine store or um, you know even at a restaurant, a bar, a wine bar, I just kind of look at the label. <laughs> I just go with yeah. what label I think is uh, <laughs> most interesting or, uh, you know, the, the prettiest. Is that a wrong way to go about it? Do you guys ever feel that same way? Labels are important. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Are, right? That's like, you know, everyone judges with their eyes. Right. And, can uh, you judge a wine by its label, so to speak? Well, a wine can be horrible and have a nice label. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Or vice right. versa. Or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> That's, Yeah. 
I feel, you know, I'm luckier working in a wine bar. It's sure everyone wants to Instagram everything, so that's still part of it. Mm-hmm. But then people are purchasing off of the list, not photos, um, not a visual yeah. aspect. Um, eh, but in France, they do. You know, it's often actually all the bottles are on the wall because you can purchase them to go as well. Sure. Um, God, that's great. Yeah. Uh, we should we should open up another one, please. Yeah. I would and love speaking to. Speaking of labels, yeah, exactly. Coppich <laughs> has an amazing label, I think. That is beautiful. So pastoral. Uh, it's some grapes, some sailboats. Uh, nice shade of green, a nice Kelly green, I would say. Yes, this is uh, super special for me. Uh, so this is Alex and Maria Kopich out of Bergenland, Austria. Okay. Um, I worked harvest for them this past September. And what does that mean? You actually harvested some grapes for them? Yeah. What was that like? Amazing. I got a gym membership before I went so I could be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that strenuous? Well, I was really nervous. I didn't oh. want to be a wimp yeah. you know, or complaining or anything. Um, it is. It's physical. I mean, look labor. at, you know, <laughs> this. I took these off before I went. My, yeah, but nails. very nails. manicured uh, <laughs> nails. Uh, <laughs> that didn't fly? No, Did no. No? Okay. Uh, but... So they're amazing. I'm obsessed with them. Anyone that knows me or June Wine Bar knows Kopich because they are basically my family now. Um, I don't just like their wines. Uh, Maria, I consider one of my best girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Um, I met them a few years ago on a trip with Jenny and Francois to Austria, which I fell in love with. And... So yeah, they make really incredible wines. Um, They're just incredibly infectious, wonderful people. And their wines are bright and fun. They have multiple lines of wine. Um, This is called Ret. How do you spell that? R-E-T. And yeah, so the front label shows some sailboats on Lake Nicedal, which they are situated on. Which is a, a really huge, beautiful lake. Huge lake, stunning, um, and really great kind of microclimate around the lake. Yeah. Um, that uh, I would I would buy that wine based on its label. Yeah. I enjoy that label. She worked hard on this label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're awesome. <laughs> this wine is really fun. I've been sipping it uh, while you've been talking about your harvesting, um, and it's it's really fun. It's. Would you describe this one as funky? Am I wrong here? You know, definitely the nose. Okay, let's talk yeah. about the nose first. It's a little like poopy barnyardy, mm-hmm. but like not in a, not in a bad way. No, it's not yeah. a bad thing. Like, well, so that that kind of smell is often when you first open a wine. Sometimes it's a little bit closed. Mm-hmm. A wine is all about the, how much oxygen you let in and how much you don't let in. Right. You know, if there's too much oxygen, a wine has been open like a week or two weeks. Too much oxygen, the wine can fall apart but too little oxygen sometimes uh you know it's a little bit closed down and so if you just like twirl your glass around that can blow off right so the spinning of glasses isn't you know to an look affectation bougie yeah. and, you know, like, <laughs> although it, it um, does look very bougie <laughs> as um, i do it right in spin. front of me yeah this wine you could say it's a little tight right now and then you it's that is going to blow off as this wine is exposed to oxygen. I'm not going to put this in a decanter. It doesn't need mm-hmm. that, but it just, it's open, and now in five minutes, it's going to be singing. What do you mean by singing? Singing, I like that. perfect. No. It's yeah. Gonna, yeah, yeah, like at its height. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's going to blow off, and you're going to get something else. And yeah. If we sit here long enough and so, twirl long enough. <laughs> well. So, um, at, talking a little bit about Jenny and Francois selections, uh, what do you look for from a winemaker? Like, you know, what what is do they do they pitch themselves to you? Do you seek them out? Um, it's a little of everything. Uh, usually, word of mouth, mm-hmm. or I mean, I get so many solicitations; it's hard to even like open the emails. Yeah, <laughs> or bottles sent to us. But what I look for is is my pleasure, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and for me. I recognize what a natural wine is. I recognize its liveliness. I recognize that it's alive. I recognize that the mouthfeel, you know, it's, that's what it's about. And so, you know, there's many different ways. You're not going to compare a $15 on the shelf wine with, you know, a $50. It's, you know, you're looking for something different in terms of price point. Um, 
and, and what the wine is. That's great. Um, you know, and uh, I think we have to bring this up not to bring politics into it, but I mean, politics is in everything now. I know, Jen, you had a byline in the Times, um, the insanity of Trump's wine tariff. Yes. Can you explain a little bit about um, what the wine tariff is and how that affects people like you and also people like us who just like to enjoy natural wine? So um, because of a conflict between Airbus and Boeing, mm -hmm. um, the World Trade Organization is allowing the US to retaliate with tariffs against Europe because Europe's give subsidies to Airbus. So sure. it says, what does this have to do with wine? Nothing. Yeah. But the threat was, oh, we should uh, put a 100% tariff on, on wine. I don't think anyone would pay 100% more for any of these wines, really. So, as much as I love them, you know, it'd be tough. <laughs> um, so yeah. I think it basically would have killed off importers, distributors, uh, wine bars like June, um, you know, retailers. Um, it would have destroyed a three-tier uh, industry because the wine world is importers, distributors. It's government mandated three sure. tiers. So, um, so I've been in in DC um, fighting this tariff, and we just got word that it's at least postponed, if not canceled. But okay. the threat is still there, and there's still a 25 percent tariff since October on French, German, and Spanish wine. Yikes! So um, it's 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 hard times. It's right. Not no fun. <laughs> no, that's that's awful. Um, oh, hopefully that doesn't end up going through so we can continue enjoying these without that 100% markup. Absolutely. That's quite a lot. It's, uh, it's massive. So write your representative and say no wine tariffs. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so the fourth and final wine, Lena, do you want to describe wh yeah. what is this exactly? So this is Christian Cheetah. Okay. Also Great from, name. Yes. Love it. Um, also from Bergenland, Austria, I love. Uh, it's called Himmel auf Erden, okay. which means heaven on earth. I am I have a... Austrian lover, so I'm learning German. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it is his skin contact. Um, okay. So he'll do a white, rosé, and red as well. So this is another quote-unquote orange. Correct. Cool. Uh, but a still one as opposed to the sparkling. Got it. Okay, so you know, spin your glass right now? Yeah, I, I, the spinning. So oh, what does that exactly do? And wait, how? no. I, it's just fascinating. You okay. are spinning clockwise. Okay. Almost everyone spins counterclockwise and mm. Christian really believes that you should spin clockwise because you're turning with the earth and then the wine is going to show its best and he's a self-proclaimed genius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's, <laughs> okay. He's should a we character. take his word for that? Yeah. Uh, so and I also want to talk to you about um, you know, the rise in natural wine bars with the rise of natural wine. So what would you look for? You know, I think June is a great example of um, a, a great natural wine bar. I'm looking for diversity of producers and regions. Um, I'm looking for knowledgeable staff. I'm looking for staff that's excited about what they're doing, right? Natural wine has made its way across the country. You know, I'm going to Florida this weekend for the first time in my life. Uh, Tampa. I Congratulations. Looked, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up, uh, you know, natural wine in Tampa. Yeah. And what did you find? <laughs> there's there, a few places. There yeah, yeah, there's a wild. few places. Yeah, right. and yeah. I'm really excited. And I'm just, I, you know, I'm going for my cousin's wedding, but I'm going to sneak away and, like, <laughs> just talk about natural wine and how people are receiving it down there. Mm -hmm. And... How, what what they're drinking, you know, what they have access to as well. Jenny, someone that's that's been doing this for a couple of decades. Um, were there any natural wine bars like when you started? Like, have you just seen this entire movement just take off? There were no natural wine bars. Yeah, <laughs> there were no natural wine stores. Yeah, you know, it was my pleasure and honor to like walk around trying to educate people and. Uh, to anyone who would listen, you know, it was a French movement. It's become a world movement. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many knowledgeable people now <laughs> um, in terms of natural wine, and we're so lucky to have places like June where we can hang out and just present the wines to somebody who knows what she's talking about. Yeah. And there, there's just a huge generation um, of, of wine lovers who have yeah. really... Um, Embrace this movement. Embraced it. Yeah, yeah. They, they totally have. Um, really important to point out that it's only really because of Jenny that 
I get to do what I do and drink what I want and that kind of America is exposed to natural wine, like so much of it is due to this woman. So oh, even just to be sitting you. here, <laughs> just to be sitting here with her right now is oh, an absolute you. honor and privilege. And um, the best. That's you know, great. I consider her a friend, but I also, <laughs> she's a complete role model idol. That's awesome. We're t- here we are. Look at us drinking wine, getting <laughs> sentimental with each other. <laughs> um, this this la- this glass in front of us um, that I've been sipping on, of course, uh, as we've been talking, uh, to me, I-, I love it, as I've loved all of them. This seems to be, um, I would say, maybe the most muted, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It just it seems to be like, uh, I don't want to say weakest, but it doesn't have all of those flavors that are immediately jumping out. I, I really like it. Um, would you say that's fair to say? Yeah, it's a little softer. It's not yeah. kind of crazy piercing acidity right um you you know i i think that's funny too because in kind of the opposite way this has no sulfur so Mm -hmm. and maybe the most hardcore natural of all of these wines would you say there are any tangible downsides of natural wine versus conventional wine i think the biggest downside is that there is not a there's not rules and regulations, which is also the benefit, right? Mm-hmm. That you know we're not living in this stagnant world, but it allows for poor winemaking to get confused with natural winemaking. It's not any consumer's fault that they cling on to buzzwords like funky. Yeah. But um, you know when people are seeking out faults and then attributing that as natural wine. Then, then there's a disconnect and it damages our reputation. There's so much benefit in uh, traditional wine knowledge, which I have as well. I mm-hmm. didn't jump into natural wine. I got into wine. Yeah. And, um, you know, not having a clear defined definition allows for lots of mishaps or confusion and that's that's what's most difficult for me um seeing criticism from actually older people you know that see it as a young alternative movement and it's you know (laughs) like some radical movement yeah when it's it's really the opposite yeah Yeah. it's complete opposite yeah so um yeah well it's radical in that it's a risk to work this way and it's not like economically um more advantageous Mm -hmm. for people working in the vines that way it takes a lot of work and a lot of labor and then making the wine is more of a risk than to like have a formula where you add sulfites add tartric acid add sugar and which which could make business sense really it it makes business sense so it is a it is kind of uh, i mean the radical part of it is that it's kind of outside, uh, you know, a specific rationality of capitalism. But then, <laughs> you know, I mean, so you really, I mean, winemakers really have to be believers. And we who sell this wine have to believe in their project. And their project is also ecological um, and something I believe strongly in. But then it's also pleasure. And so, you know, we're both very serious about curating our lists. But then, to see um, people bringing in wines that are just messed up and saying, oh, well, these are natural wines, and then people confusing that with uh, with all this hard work that these producers are doing, that's, that's kind of the downside, I would say. Got it, okay. Um, so as I pour one more glass of this Calcareous, which I think is my favorite <laughs> of the bunch, I have to say, uh, I wanna ask you one final question. Do you think that natural wine will be a fleeting trend. Do you think it'll be one of the things where people, you know, 30 years from now will make a movie about the year 2019 and kind of have a natural wine bar in as a trope? Mm-hmm. Um, or do you think it will integrate itself in the wine world forever? Do you think that natural wine and the process of making natural wine will ever just become the norm where we won't call it natural wine, we'll just call it wine, and the reverse of that will be an anomaly? Um, I mean, I think that with global warming, there's there's no turning back from responsible farming mm-hmm. and responsible viticulture. So the short answer is this can't be a trend because we all need to change our ways right. and we need to save our planet. 
wineries are the biggest polluter in France, for example. Mm-hmm. People don't think about that no, because no, they think I would about never have thought that. the beautiful vines. No, these are like huge, huge polluters. Yeah, Rick Steves never mentioned that <laughs> when he goes. <laughs> 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 um, so that's number one. Um, and number two, it's just the U.S. is a growing, you know, people are becoming more and more educated. It's a young market in terms of wine consumption and traditions around wine are are still young in this country. So I only see um, more expansion of natural wine drinking and the pleasure surrounding appreciating a bottle of natural wine. Yeah, cool. Same. Uh, I think absolutely. It's it's only moving forward um, 100%. The only thing that could change is kind of this, you know, influencer Instagram kind of fetishizing professionals, um, which I do and I love. I, I love <laughs> these winemakers. I sometimes reference myself as a natty wine hype woman. And I am. You know? Flavor Flav of Natty Wine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like sometimes Flavor Flav is on the playlist at my wine bar. Just so you know, <laughs> Club June. Perfect. Um, but I love being a fan. I love being excited about these winemakers. You know, I mean, this is my whole world. So that's one thing. But um, I think that trend of it being the cool thing mm-hmm. might adjust at some point, and that's fine. You Which know. might be a good thing for the yeah. natural Correct. Wine, really. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct, because it being so cool has allowed for some confusion, whatever. But, yeah. Totally. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Okay, um, this was great. Thank you again, uh, Jenny and Francois Selections. Look for the label on the back of Natural Thanks Wine. Thanks so much for having um, me. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, and uh, June Wine Bar in Cabo Hill, Brooklyn, if you're ever, if you're ever there. It's, it's a must visit, especially yes. if you love natural wine, of dates course. Dates or not. <laughs> yeah, dates or not. And do you have an Instagram that you want to plug? Uh, Lena Boo. Lena <laughs> two underscores boo. <laughs> there, you go. there we go. <laughs> and Jenny, is there, is there a social media or a website? Jenny Francois is our Instagram. There you uh, go. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> And while I'm here, at Will Fulton, that'd be great, <laughs> on Twitter and Instagram. Um, be our friends. This was awesome. So enjoy natural wine. Swirl your glasses clock- clockwise if you Cheers. can. Um, and this is great. I also think that this is the first podcast that we've done where no one's cursed. Oh. Which is <laughs> fucking awesome, in my opinion. <laughs> but thank you guys for coming on so much. This was great. One last cheers. One last cheers. Drink. What a great way to start off the morning. Thank, thank you guys you. so much. Cool. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for listening. We're 20 episodes in, so it's the end of season one. But we will be back for season two, so stick around. There will be updates on the site. Um, We hope to see you again one day very soon. Thanks.